has for you. If you have been saved and the Lord has saved you and the Lord has brought you in the kingdom, God never saved you without giving you a purpose or something that God wants you to do. There's no such thing as somebody that God saved I brought in the kingdom and he don't want them to do anything because in the book of Ephesians 1 and 4 Ephesians 1 and 4 according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy y'all with me without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So listen to me. Listen to me good. You got saved because God had something for you to do. He gave you the Holy Ghost because he had a work for you to do. Everybody in here. There's nobody that's been called into the truth. Nobody has been saved that God don't have a purpose for the work. Go to Romans chapter 8. Get it quickly, Romans 8 chapter. It says, 8. And 28. 8 and 28. I want you to read it together on the count of three. One, two, three, eight, and twenty-eight. And we know that all things work together for good to them that what? Who are the what? Called according to what? So he called you because he had a purpose. Now you might not know what that purpose was, but he called you because you had a purpose. And you are the call according to his purpose. Somebody's purpose may be singing. Somebody's purpose may be preaching. Somebody's purpose may be evangelizing. And those purposes are divided into three sections. Either God called you to do a service to him. Either he called you to serve the man of God that you're under. Or he called you to serve the people. It's divided into three sections, the call of God. So either you are called to serve the people, called to serve the man of God, or called for a particular service to him. And that's where people get the problem trying to find out what am I called for and who is my ministry to. So what am I to do? Because we got a lot of people that are saved and they're trying to find their way in the church, find out, God, I know you got more for me to do than come in the church and sit down. I know you got more for me to do than come and just be a member and clap and sing when it, and get involved in services. I want to know that because that's a part of really keeping you saved. Listen to me. That's a part of keeping you saved. Knowing your calling will keep you from falling. Can you say that? Let's say it together on the count of three. One, two, three. Now, a lot of people don't associate their spiritual life and maintain their spiritual life to the call that God has for them. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1 and 10. So they don't associate their spiritual life and say, you know what? I'm going to pray so I don't backslide. I'm going to read my Bible song backslide. But they haven't equated that knowing your ministry, knowing the call that God has in your life and what God has chosen you to do can keep you from going back. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. What I say, Second Peter what? 1 and 10. Second Peter 1 and 10, when you get to say praise the Lord. All right? But for the rather brethren, Give diligence to make your what? Calling and election what? For if you do these things, you shall never fall. So protecting my spiritual life 
has something to do with making my calling and election sure and finding out what God has called me for and what God has elected me to. And God gives me a guarantee that if I do these things, I'll never fall. And the question is, and I want to take a serious survey tonight, and I need y'all to help me with this serious survey that I'm going to ask tonight. I need some hands to go up and let some folk hear me. How many of y'all know what God called you for? Yeah, what your purpose is? Let me see your hand. How many of you know? Everybody know. Let me get you to stand up if you know what God, what your purpose is. Let me see you. Stand up if you know it. All right, stand up if you know it. All right. Now, I may put you on the spot, so y'all about to make sure you know it. All right. Now, you're going to be seated. I'm going to ask some of y'all. You say you know it. And then my next question is, how do you know that's what God wants you to do? Now, you say you know it. Now, I want to know how do you know that's what you're supposed to be doing? Because God say, make it sure. So all y'all that got your hands up that say you know what you're supposed to be doing, let me see your hand again. I won't see you. All right? Because I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to ask some questions. I'm going to start with my Wednesday night challenger. <laughs> my cookie girl. <laughs> you know what your calling is? Your election is? What is it? The same. Same? Anything else? Prophetess. I believe that. Those two you got right. <laughs> she, 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 this is what she said. He told me, so I know it's right. <laughs> <laughs> what? Keep it in your spirit. Don't ever get rid of it. And know that. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. Junior, come here. You got your hand up in the back. Junior say, take your seatbelt. Put your seatbelt on. I remember that message. Put your seatbelt on. All right? What's your, what's your call in the election? To preach, sing, play the drums, cast out demons. Well, praise the Lord, boy. And it'd be good in school. <laughs> this is pretty good. This is pretty good to hear that. Anybody else know what your calling is? Let me go to some of these old folks. Anybody else know what your calling is? What's calling is? Nobody else? All right. Ella Sheffield. He said, go where he sent. Go where the Lord sent him. Wherever he sent the preach to go. Now, then the next thing you need to know, good to see Brother Tim tonight. Now, when y'all don't see Tim, he watching. He be calling me, telling me what we preached on and everything. He be saying amen on the phone. <laughs> Good to see you, Tim. Now, knowing having your calling and your election, then who do you, how many of y'all know who you supposed to minister to? Who you supposed to minister to? And sometimes it changes because sometimes God have you ministering to people to learn so that he can put you in the area that you want you to minister in. That happens a lot of times. I'm going to go over that because because for years, Elder Sheffield ministered to me. That was his ministry, to be my driver. That's all he did. He ministered to me. But while he was ministering to me, and he was following me and going around different places preaching, he was learning and God was equipping him to be ministering to the church. And I found out, and it's very important that you see this, I found out that most people that minister to the man of God generally are the next ones to go out and minister to people. So I found out what God was doing, so that's why I ended up having a lot of, all the pastors that generally that pastor were my drivers. Once, once Ella Sheffield got moved out, Ella Johnson came in, once Ella Johnson came out, and all of them started being drivers. So the saints already started saying, they said, don't be driving pastor. They said, oh, well, he called you to drive. Uh oh, 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 that means, son, you next. They always, they always, whenever they saw that car crank up, say, time to drive. Say, oh, oh, you the next one. You the next target. But I want you to go with me quickly so we can understand this. I'm going to come back to some of you all. Because this is the year that God wants you to know 
what he wants to do in your life and then God wants you to fulfill it. This is the year that God wants you to walk in the ministry that God has given you. And if you haven't been walking totally in it, if you've been walking 50% in it, 80% of it, 30% in it, 20% of it, I'm praying that God will put you in the full capacity because some of you all are walking in it partially. But God will give you the full, full capacity of what he wants you to do. You see, you're part of the body of Christ and there's God doesn't have a body that doesn't have parts of it that doesn't work. He wants the whole body working. Somebody say hallelujah. We joke, tell somebody, God is going to use me. Tell them again, he's going to use me. Go with me quickly to the book of Exodus 28. Exodus 28 and 1. Exodus 28, chapter first verse. All right. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that is wise hearted, whom I have filled with spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garment to consecrate him, that he may minister to me in the priest's office. I want you to look at verse 3 again, and look at it real good. And it said, and thou shalt make Aaron's garment, so get all the wise hearted people, and thou shalt speak unto all the, that are wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garment to to consecrate him to minister to me. Two things I want you to see. And there's two ministries that you can see. Aaron, who was the minister to who? The Lord. But whoever was making Aaron's clothes was preparing him to minister to the Lord. Now, in the church, you've got ushers, you got nurses, all of these people that work in this capacity. They are not ministers in the sense of preaching, a ministering to the Lord while I'm ministering. But you're ministering to me so that I can minister to him. Everybody can't be on the spotlight but there are people that God has designed to, to, to minister to other people that are on the spotlight. And that's where we get sometimes a lot of problem because those people are not seen. People don't see them. They don't get a lot of praise. They don't get a lot of glory. They don't get a lot of but they're ministering to the man of God who's ministering to the Lord. So there's a whole lot of people when you take certain jobs that you're working on. Uh, Brother Bam, you may be the builder, you and Brother Bam may be the builder, but you need somebody else to hand your nails, somebody else to hand your hammers, somebody else to do those kind of things there. And a lot of times, we devalue ministry to people. And we only look at the people that are ministering on the spotlight. But when you're playing music, when you're playing drums, you're different things like that, although you're ministering to the Lord. When you're working cameras, you're ministering to me. You all that are driving, you're ministering to me. You all that are doing those things. And it's important. And, and what the devil likes to do is make people feel when they minister to people that their job is insignificant. And people, they really talk bad about people that minister to people. Oh, I wouldn't be doing all that. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be helping them. I wouldn't be messing up my cars running down the road. Oh, you're going to feed them. You're going to do that. They don't understand ministering to people. So the Lord said, Aaron, I want you, uh, Moses, I want you to get somebody to make some clothes that Aaron may minister to me. All right? So there's a ministry to the Lord that Aaron has. First Samuel chapter 3 and 1. First Samuel 3 and 1. When you get it, say praise the Lord. Third chapter, first verse, it says, And the child Samuel did what? Ministered unto who? He ministered to who? So what was Samuel's job? To minister to the Lord. What was Aaron's job? To minister to the Lord. I'm just showing you the difference. There's ministry to the Lord. And then when you go over to the book of Exodus, chapter uh, Esther, chapter 2, Let's go to Esther, chapter 2. You'll see the difference. Esther 2 and 2. Then said the king's servants that ministered unto what? Him. So the king had servants that ministered to him. Let there be found young virgins sought for the king. So they ministered unto who? The king. Go to the book of Exodus 24 and 13. Exodus 24 and 13. 
24 and 13. All right? And Moses rose up and his minister and his minister and his minister, Joshua. Y'all see that? And Moses went up and to the mount of God. So the question that I have to ask you tonight is who are you ministering to? Are you ministering to the Lord? Are you ministering to the man of God? So when I when I say a lot of times, minister so-and-so, minister so-and-so, some of y'all ain't never preaching in the congregation because you're not a minister to the church. And you're not a minister to the Lord, but you're a minister to me. And see, a lot of people don't understand that. And technically, because we've limit, we put the word minister as to preaching, we don't understand. There are women that are ministers. And they don't preach, they don't pastor. Minister means administer. Prove that. Prove that. All right. That's why we need to watch the words that we eliminate and put those words with this modern definition rather than the definition that the Bible gave. When the Bible deals with ministering, he's not dealing with pastoring. Uh, you can minister and never step foot in that pulpit. Every usher is a minister. You're ministering to the people. Every musician is a minister. Even the ones on the camera the other night, you're a minister. So let's prove that. Let's go over to Matthew. All right? I want you to see this. So that you can see the definition of that word. Go over to Matthew chapter I'm sorry. Yes, Matthew chapter 8 and 5. See, we've let this modern day definition of minister mess us up. And people don't know their call because when I say, what is your ministry? Are you a minister? They say, oh, I don't, I, I'm not a good speaker. I don't speak. I don't speak well. I, I don't, no, but, but that's not what he's saying. Look at the book of Matthew chapter 8 and 5. It says, uh, uh, Matthew the 8th chapter. And eight and 15. All right, 8 and 14. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his mother, his wife's mother lay sick of the fever. So Peter's mother-in-law, we know Peter was married, was sick and she was staying at Peter's house. Peter probably tried to get out of there. <laughs> so Peter called Jesus to come pray for her. And he touched her hand and the fever left her and she arose and ministered unto them. Now, with this modern-day definition, they all think that she got up and started preaching. But when the Bible says she arose and ministered unto them, uh, she probably most likely was serving them, or were giving them food or taking care of whatever needs they have. But she arose and ministered unto them. So when you got people that are on the food court, people that are serving all those, uh, Mother Harris and Br Brother Harry to be out front and uh, Mother uh, Sister Scott and all those, cause Sister Sandra in heaven. We don't look at, y'all don't look at yourself as ministers or ministry, but that's ministry. The van people, that's ministry. So I need to find out, God, what it's so. Sometimes when I give y'all a task to do and a particular task to do, and some of y'all are worried and they hear from the Lord and I want to hear the Lord, you think God going to give some divine message that say, oh, my daughter, Cook collard greens today. Thank the Lord. Gonna say, Sandra, behold, I speak unto thee now. Pick thou up at the spoon and go up thou out in the front end of the church. You know, we think that deep when we say front it and go it and out it. Thus said the Lord it. Go forth now, my daughter. Pick thou up the spoon. Dip it within the macaroni and place it on the plate, my daughter of Zion. God ain't gonna do that. 
But when I say, sister so-and-so, would you go out front and help them with that? I'm appointing you to ministry. Sister so-and-so, could you help us get involved in this? I'm appointing you to ministry. And you're looking for something to come out of the sky when God is preparing you for those things that I've asked you to do. And you don't know he's trying to prepare you and equip you for something that may be greater. So remember that. There's ministry to the Lord, there's ministry to the people, and there's ministry to the saints. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 6 and 10. Hebrews chapter 6 and 10. And it's important that you know the difference because some of you all are not built to minister to people. You don't have the patience for it. Everybody, let me, I want y'all to get this. Everybody that God is choosing is not made to minister to people. There's some of you, that, that's a matter of fact, let me tell you, there's some of you now, the Lord has he has conditioned you to sing only to him. You don't need no mic. The Lord even called it noise. He said, make a no draw for noise unto the Lord. Yours ain't to be to everybody. There's some of us who minister to the church and some of y'all who minister to the Lord. You got to know the difference. So if you, you, this is important to know because you got people who don't know who their ministry is will come into the church, give me the mic. Why? Because the Lord told me to sing a joyful noise to him. But that's what he said to him. He didn't tell you because the Lord also said, play skillfully. All right? Play skillfully upon the music. So, you know, people think, and the church has made this mistake because we think everybody who has a gift, a talent that they should just, you know, automatically. But there, there's some things that God said, these are, these are strictly for me. And I have to know the difference because people will lie to you about your voice. Saints will edge you on about your preaching. Preach, brother. Preach. And they, preach. They get down and they pat you at the back when church is over. Man, let me tell you, you know you put down some singing. Now, they tell you that. And then if I tell you you can't sing Sunday and lead the praise service, you say, I'm trying to hinder you. He's trying to hold me back. Because you get three or four people who say, you all right. And I say, no, no, no. Since you can't lead devotion this morning, you ain't able to do that. But, but that's just the spirit of jealousy. You, you hindering me. You, you blocking. But I know because they said, but see, maybe God appointed you to sing to them. Because they equipped to hear it. Everybody, everybody that can cook can't serve. Some of y'all, God only wants you to cook the food, set it on the table and go back. Because your attitude is not ready for dealing with people. Don't get mixed up. Know when God stops. So if you're a person that's always confrontational, always short, don't have a smiley face, and an excellent cook, and we thank that. Boy, that's just a source who can cook, and she, she's just as happy as she can be in the kitchen, but she get in front of people. Uh, uh, here, here, hold your plate up here. Okay, next. Come on, come on, come on. Move it now. Move it, move it. I got to get home. Move it. But God only wants you, when you get out the kitchen, you stop. Drop the food off, go back home. Everybody's not chosen to be an usher. So now I got to find out. That's why it's important that you find out what your call and election is. And, and, and go with me quickly to Hebrews chapter 6 and 10. And listen to me well. I want you to get this. Hebrews 6 and 10, it says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work of labor, of love, which ye have showed towards his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So that's one that ministered to the saints. So, so far, what have we got? Minister to the Lord, minister to the man of God, and now we got ministry to the saints. Those are the three categories of ministries that's in the church. And I want to tell you all something. God does not allow you, does not allow you to pick and choose the one you want to do. So sometime in ministry, we feel like if we don't like it, that ain't what God's got us to do. 
And that's what bothers us because everybody want to like what it is that God happened to do. But there are some of you that God is calling you for. God doesn't care if you don't like it. He's God. Now y'all stop telling God, use me, do whatever you want. Then when God tells you to use me, you say, I don't want to do that. Amen. Y'all with me? Follow me now. I need y'all to follow me. Amen. All right, give me Hebrews. We read that. So y'all see that? The ministry to the saints. There's another one. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and 1. 2 Corinthians 9 and 1. And I'm interested in finding this what God got for me to do. 2 Corinthians 9 and 1. Some of us, we like what God has us to do. There's those of us that like it. Those of us, those of us that are for it. But then those of us don't like it. We don't want to do it. God, why you call me to do this? Why, why you want me to do this? Why, why am I doing this? Why there are many of us that are there? I happen to love what God has called me for and chosen me for. I love it. I love it. I loved it before I even knew that God called me to it. As a little boy, about the age of your son there, that Messiah, right? About that age right there, a young boy, my mother could tell you, I love church. I would get up, I'd sing at his age, shout and testify. I just loved it. It was just in me. It was just, I was just born with it. And just my, my, my love. But there are other people that I know, they didn't want to do what God had for them to do. They fought, they battled, they kicked. But the point is, both of them are still chosen. Whether you want to do it or not, it's still a task that God got for you to do. And you might as well stop liking it because God ain't going to let you off the hook. Amen. Give me 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and 1. Listen, for as touching the ministry, the ministry what? To the what? Ministry to the what? All right, get 2 second, second, uh, second Corinthians 8 and 4. Praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. And boy, that can be a hard one because saints got some ways. But I got the ministry to the saints, I got the ministry to the man of God, and I got the ministry to the Lord. And my question now, which one is, is, is your, what God wants you to do? What is it that God wants you to do? This is in-house. I ain't talking about outhouse now, but in-house. Where's my ministry? Am I a ministry to uh, the man of God? Is that what God specifically asked me to do? I want to work to help fulfill your vision, pastor. That's what God is calling me for. Am I one that ministered to the people of God in the church? Or God, am I one that ministered to you? You see, uh, you all, there are many of you all that are called, there are different type of fastings. There are people that fast for other people. There are people that fast uh, for themselves. But then there's a group of you that your fast is to minister to the Lord. Go to the book of Acts. Book of Acts. Book of Acts. Chapter 13. And one. Now, there was in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simon, that was called Niger and Lurin the Syrian, and Minion, which had been brought up with Herod the treacherous, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. So here's a group that was in there praying and laying out before God. They were ministering to the Lord in fasting. There's a prayer meeting that, that we pray for people. There's a prayer meeting that we pray for the church. But there's a prayer meeting that we pray simply to minister to God. That's powerful that God would have somebody minister to him. Because he, he wants ministry to him as well. He wants people that will serve him. So your job is to, to totally dedicated to make him happy. And when you serve him, that's like when you go to a restaurant, you got a person that that's your waiter, and they just, so there are people that whatever the Lord need, we say, hey, we need somebody in the church to have prayer tonight. They say, oh, I'm, I'm, that, that, that's my part, my, my job. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. We need some people that's going to read the Bible. We need some people that's going to lay out. That's my job. Yeah. That's the ministering to him. Yeah. You see, Mother Coward, Mother Cooper, they are ministering to the Lord. Mother Coward stays in the church. Hours and hours, 
days and days. How specific the job is to minister to the Lord. Most time, God don't call you to minister to the Lord if you got a husband. Because you can't minister to both at the same time. So a lot of time, some of y'all that's ministering to the Lord need to go back home. And minister to your husband. It's true. God don't want your idea of cooking communion bread and your husband ain't had no light bread. He don't want your idea of trying to help us baptize, get souls washed, and you ain't washed no dishes in your house. So God don't God ain't gonna try to break up one house to fix his house. So y'all ain't saying nothing. I wish I had some of y'all here. Go, go with me to First Corinthians. Make sure this is right. So I'm trying to help y'all find your way in ministry. All right? Look at the book of First Corinthians chapter 7. Sometimes your ministry is based upon your status. Y'all with me? Your ministry is based upon your status. Many times, God selected the ministry that he has on you based upon your status. I want to show you this to make sure you got this. And as your status change then your ministry may change. First Corinthians chapter 7 and 1, 7 and 32, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is married care for the thing that belongeth to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married care for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. So listen, listen how God does this. If your ministry conflicts with an obligation that God gave you to do, God will say to you, all right, let your ministry down and fulfill that ministry that I gave you to your husband first. Amen. So some of y'all might have to put up that praying robe and put on another robe and go home. You around here praying and your husband home ain't eight and you around here somewhere like this. Children hungry, stomach stuffed out, and you out there with the robe on. Don't let people call you and see people will call you into something that by you know they got we having an all night prayer, we having this, that's fine. But you may have to have an all night there while other people have an all night prayer. Because you have an obligation to your own. So my status can really change my ministry. Now it's important that you make sure that the status doesn't conflict with me. Let me give you something else. I want you to watch this. I'm talking heavy now. Y'all young ladies with all these babies and children, y'all got children, you got a responsibility to your children. I don't want you around here getting so involved that, that with, with, with kingdom work, don't, don't, don't get me wrong now. Don't get me wrong. God does want you to be involved, but you are a mother and you are a wife and you got responsibility that you got to do. I don't want you around here praying with a nice iron robe on your children out there, the hand done, and they walk around with a dirty t-shirt on. Because it's about building the kingdom of God. And that's going to hurt the kingdom of God if people see you always at the church praying and your children ain't had a haircut, you know, and they don't look right, so you won't make sure. Y'all ain't said much to me. Well, you said, well, what you want me to do home, bastard? What you want me to do, stay home and not come to church? No, what I want you to do is get off that Facebook, wash your dishes, clean your house, then you can come to church. Because a lot of stuff that y'all putting on the church ain't the church. A lot of y'all husbands and stuff that's upset with the church because they think that y'all be at church two or three o'clock in the morning. Church at that nine, y'all sitting up there three hours talking, running your mouth. You need to get on home and take care of your husband. Y'all with me tonight? So your ministry can be uh, based upon your status. That's very important. It's very important. Now, I'm not discouraging people of doing things in the kingdom of God. What I'm doing is trying to get some of y'all to see that some of y'all saying that stuff is the Lord ain't the Lord. Because there's a lot of things the Lord wouldn't be conflicting 
against some of the things that you got going on. We got some really dedicated praying women, dedicated women, but some of you all don't have some things together that y'all need to have together with these children. Some of you don't have some things together that you need to have together with these husbands. Amen. Y'all with me? Amen. All right. Listen to this. I want you to go. Go with me in the book of Numbers, chapter 30. Now, I'm not telling you not to do the things that belong to the Lord. But what I'm telling you is to put your priorities straight and get the things in the home straightened so that you can do the things of the Lord. Amen. Lift your hands up and say hallelujah. Lift them up again and say hallelujah. You know, some of you, you may not know it, but you don't really qualify to work in the kingdom of God till you get some of your business right. <clears throat> what am I trying to say? Because your first ministry as a woman is to your husband and children. And then after you fulfill those duties of husband and children, then you're released to do other duties. And a lot of you all that are saved are not good mothers. You're not. And y'all are saved. You got the Holy Ghost, but you're not good mothers. Children fell in grades in school, and y'all ain't helping them. You sitting on the phone. Hello? I said children are failing grades in school, and you're talking about you're trying to get them saved. How you going to get them saved? They ain't going to even know how to read the Bible when they get through. So you have a responsibility. Let, let me, hey amen, I'm, I'm talking now. See, one of the things, Sister Coward and I were very, very busy, busy, busy going. I was busy, she was busy. But one thing you can believe, she made sure those children got their work. She made sure they got their homework. She made sure they took care of their responsibility. She made sure they was clean. She made sure they took baths, and when they came to church, you they had their little bowls and looked. They looked like they looked like children. Some of our children look like they're thrown away. Some of y'all them, I, I look at them. Some of y'all them take no time. They're not taking decent baths. They're not dressed decently, and you're not focusing on those children. Straighten that mess up. I want you praying. And all right, it's all right that your hand, your hand got all that good olive oil on it. You about to put some pine salt and some bleach in it and clean that out. Now, I'm not killing your ministry, but I'm telling you, know what the first, and get those clear. And let, me, let me make sure I'm in the Bible. I'm going to make sure I'm in the Bible. Make sure I'm in the Bible. I want y'all to go with me. Go to the book of 1 Timothy. Chapter 5, 1 Timothy 5. Now, I'm not discouraging you, you from being in prayer, but I'm telling, I, I, all I'm telling you, I want the responsibilities taken care of first. The ministry of the home, the ministry of children, the ministry of family. That's what I want to take care of first. Then, now, what it's supposed to be, now, all you women that are not married, right, Instead of y'all at the movie and everywhere else, I'm not dying against the movie, but instead of y'all doing everything else, then y'all should be in here doing the work of the Lord that the married folk doing. But we got it mixed up. The married people down here praying and the, and the unmarried people down here doing the things of the world. So that's where, that's, that's, that's where we got the problem. The married are doing the things that the unmarried should be doing and the unmarried are struggling staying saved because they're seeing a whole bunch of stuff on the, in, in, the, in the movie that they shouldn't be seeing that's waking up their flesh. And then the unmarried, the married are here in the church in the husband home, his flesh woke up and they're out here standing before the Lord. Which got the whole church backwards. So we got a messed up church. So now we need to get this thing vice versa. Y'all y'all single people need to get out the world and get on this altar and y'all people that married need to get off this altar and get to your house. I'm talking Bible. Somebody say hallelujah. 
Now, ain't nothing, there, ain't nothing wrong with enjoying y'all show, but every time I look around on that Facebook, y'all single people somewhere smiling. Every time I look up. I want to see some pictures of you at that altar. You got pictures everywhere. You, you're on everywhere. You're on Mount Everest and this and that. I want you to get on Mount Zion and get out there and get to pray and lay out before the Lord so you won't have all these flesh problems. I'm talking tonight, Monday night prayer, you ain't here. Tuesday night, you ain't here. Wednesday night, you ain't here. And here go all the married people, drug and nature. Get yourself in the right place with God. And guess what's going on? I'm in here counseling all these married people. And when the married people get through, I counsel them. Then the, then the other ones come in and say, Pastor, I'm just having all kinds of battles. Yeah. When the last time you been to Monday night prayer? You don't become a Sunday, Sunday morning only saint. And y'all married people, y'all dedicated. I mean, they dedicated. Children and all, get over here, sit down. The whole row coming in. <laughs> Children and all. And y'all, y'all unmarried people come pick and choose when you come. I think I come this Sunday, next Sunday. I'm going second and fourth this week. Oh, I'm going to Monday night. I'm going to Tuesday night. You need to be dedicated. You the one got the struggle. You the one got the fight. My God, somebody lift your hands and say hallelujah. First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5. So I want you this year to minister in your home. Minister to your children. Make sure you minister to them. Make sure these little girls have their hair looking like little girls. Make sure they come looking like little girls. Make sure these young men look right. Make sure they clean behind their ears. Make sure, make sure they do it. Matter of fact, Let's start now. I want all y'all young people that's in the church today, I want y'all to sit up. I hope y'all ain't got no phones or nothing like that. Y'all sit up, young ladies. Sit up. Sit up. Sit up. Sit up. Sit up. Y'all too laid back. Sit on up. Come on. Sit all the way up. That's right. Come on. Y'all ain't at the movies. Y'all at church. Sit on up. Hey, Amen. Don't y'all look at me like that because if you sit down, I'll tell you to do it too. And your mama say something about it, i tell her too. I don't care about you looking at me funny. You and your mama sit up. Whoever y'all is in here. Thank you, Sister Shaloa helping me. I ain't talking about you. She helping me. She'll help me get them up. But you know, people look at you. You start telling something about the children. They start looking at you funny. I mean, everybody. Let's start working on doing something here in the church. Working on home. A lot of us do not spend the proper amount of time ministering to our children. Y'all, break these altars down. Get other folk, people saved. I mean, you break them down. We make an altar call. The first thing you're doing, growing, grabbing hold of somebody else's child. They grab and you see them right in church. Praise God. Sisters are, oh, you got my mama. Oh, you're crying out, crying out. Thank you, Jesus. 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 And your own child sitting back there, you ain't even take. You don't even do that at home. Take the time to minister to them. We got it backwards. Got it backwards. So let's start doing what we're supposed to do and ministering to who we're supposed to minister to to make sure those responsibilities are right. Give me First Timothy chapter 5. Listen to what it says. First Timothy 5, 5, 5 and, and, and 11. But the younger widows refuse for when they have become to wax wanting against Christ, they will marry. Having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Listen to verse 14. I will therefore that the young women marry, bear children, guide the house, that they give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So these young ladies, he said, I want you to marry, have children, and guide your house. That's a ministry. That's why he told him in that scripture, he said, now don't you take a widow in to dedicate herself to the Lord like this unless she is 60 years old, having been the wife of one man. He said, take her under 60 and her husband is dead because I'm going to require something out of her. And I don't want what I'm requiring out of her to mess up her household. And then take these young people that are single and get them into the house of the Lord. So this year, let's try to focus on our ministry. You single ladies 
and single men too. Your ministry is to him. Your ministry is to the things of God. The kingdom of God. Things that need to be done in the kingdom of God. First, lift your hands up and say hallelujah. hallelujah. Lift them up and say hallelujah. hallelujah. So when you come in and I watch and I see you in church, listen to me, and I see those children looking decent, looking good, looking holy, looking sanctified, I can say that's a woman that's in ministry. That's a woman that's in ministry for God. Look at her children. Look at how she's ministering to them. Look at her. Rather than me sitting down seeing somebody praying so hard and so dedicated, but when I look around, it's a disgrace of how their children are looking. That's ministry. So don't lose your focus. Lift your hands up and say hallelujah. Lord, I'm talking heavy here tonight. Your ministry, listen to me good, your ministry, oftentimes God don't reveal it to you, he reveal it to somebody else. And that, this is where I have a lot of the complication. Because God may tell me something that he wants you to do, Tammy, that you don't know nothing about. And when I come tell you what I want you to do and what God wants you to do, you feel inadequate. You feel like you can't do it. You feel like you don't have the power to do it. It's very rare that God tell a person directly what he want them to do. Most time he tells them through a man of God or sometimes through prophecy. The dilemma I find is when I tell some of you all what God wants you to do, because you don't like it, it don't fit what you was expecting, you're saying no to the Lord. And you think you're saying no to me. And sometimes, see the Bible says your gift will make room for you. And the very gift that you don't want to do, that's the thing that God is going to use to bless you. Something happened to me the other day. And I won't go into details. I said I wasn't going to talk about it, but I will. Because I'm not a I'm not a really a materialistic person. I don't I'm not into material things. I was raised that way. My children, I tried to help them be raised that way so that we're not caught up in the material. And my thing is just the thing. But the Lord told me to go somewhere and minister. And He told me to make a sacrifice and go minister. And He told me not to take any money when I went in that city to minister. And the other day I got a, a call from someone who was blessed and that said, he said, it's, it's your birthday. I said, yes. He says, well, I want you to know that I appreciate you and uh, I have a birthday gift for you. So yes, he said, do you wear watches? I said, Occasionally, I do. I said, well, I want to meet you. I went and got your watch. And the young man pulled out a Rolex. I said, this is for you. I didn't say that so you know I got a Rolex because you probably never see it. I wear it on special occasions because I'll lose it. Sister Coward and I already told me, do not. I said, what? She said, don't take it out. She said, you don't know what you got. You don't know what that is. <laughs> she said, put it up somewhere, lock it up. Down the don't take it out. Don't try to wear it. Don't try to do nothing. Because you're losing. Somebody pick that up. I said, what? I said, okay. I said, well, I wasn't so caught up in it. But the fact, I said that this is the fact I'm going to tell you. Had I, and I've seen God do some wonderful things. I've been blessed financially. I mean, I've seen God do some things, but that's all because that I was in the right place at the right time doing what God wanted to do. And there's some things that you all don't understand. God is asking you to do some hard things that you don't want to do so he can open up a, a, a way to bless you. And it's when you're willing to do. Do you think Abraham really wanted to kill his son? 
Do you really think that he wanted to kill his son? But God was setting him up by asking him to do something that he didn't want to do so God could determine whether he was going to bless him or not. So if you understand that God is asking you to do something that you don't want to do so he can determine what to do with you, just do it. But I don't want to do it. But I don't like doing it. Who want to kill their child that they love and cherish? Sister so-and-so, would you sing tonight? I don't want to sing. So, so and so, would you would you read the scripture? Now I don't want to do it. And then you're still saying, Lord, open a way, Lord, make a way. The Lord said, I made a way, but you just turned it down. I opened a door, but you just turned it down. So what you generally, this is how God works. Listen to me. What you generally don't want to do, that's what God wants to bless you at. Oh, Everybody lift your hands. Now, if you're going to do it, do it. If you're not, don't do it. Lift your hands and say, yes, Lord, to your will. Say it again, yes, to your will. In fact, there's some of you in some stuff that you need a breakthrough in. And if you would really be honest with God and say to the Lord, just as he did on the cross, not my will, not my will, but thy will be done. It's when you release your will and say, God, I'll do your will. That God said, I'm going to bless you. Lift both of your hands and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Would you lift them again and say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Now, some of y'all say, well, I don't want to say that now because I ain't in the room. But you done already told him years ago. Some of y'all, when we get in a hot service, you lift your hands up. Lord, whatever you want. Now you done change your mind two years later because you're not in the place or you're not in the status that you used to be. But God don't change that. When you tell those folk that you're going to pay that car payment, they don't care if you lost your job. They don't care what you They say, look, you made a vow that you're going to pay us. And God don't care what you, I'm just going through something right now. God said, I don't care what you're going through right now. You told me yes. And I, well, you know, right now, God said, you told me yes. And it's exactly what I want you to do. And some of y'all going to have problems until you say yes. See, we get to feeling all good. You know, there are seasons in our life. And we feel good. There's a season that we're shouting. There's a season that we're jumping. And Lord, when the Spirit get on us, we're doing good. We say, yes, Lord, whatever you want. Yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, yes, yes. Then a trial hit us. A trouble hit us. Are there ever times that you have a hard time? Something came up, you don't want to pay that bill? Because got something else come up? And them people... Sometimes they can be understanding. They will give you extensions and everything else. But when you, when you get to talking to them, say, look, I understand what's going on. And we, how, oh, your mother died. We pray, oh, Lord, we, well, we hope everything's well. And when are you going to pay that bill? Oh, the whole family died. Oh, Lord. Well, if y'all don't want to be with, if y'all don't want to be without lights, when everybody come for the funeral, you better pay this bill. You think God has some sympathy on you because you're going through a marriage problem? You think God has some sympathy on you because you're going through something with your child? Or God has some sympathy on you because right now you don't feel like doing it? Who want to get up and take a knife and go kill their son? But Abraham said, Lord, if that's what you require. And God ain't asking some of y'all to kill nothing. He just asked you to give him something. And you're talking about you love him and you can't give him something that he's asking for you that he gave you? Listen at this. Go with me quickly to the book of Genesis chapter 22. Listen. You're being tested. Old Testament used the word tempted, but it says... And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. He said, Take now thine son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, 
and get thee to the land of Moriah and offer him up as an offering upon one of the mountains that I will tell you. God said, get up. Go take him. Offer him up on one of the mountains that I'll tell you. And the Bible says, immediately, without a hesitation, without a second thought, it says, listen what it says. And Abraham arose early in the morning, saddled his ass and took two of his servants, you know, and, 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 his, and, and the servants, the young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood and burnt offerings and rose up and went into the place which God had told him. I want to be like that with God. And if God tell me something, then I'll immediately move because I become his minister. God said, get up. So it's much easier, it's much more complex than we think. It's much more than saying to God, I want to get up behind that pulpit and preach. It's much more than that. When you say you're God's minister, or when you say you're the minister of the people, if you say you're the minister of the man of God, it's really saying I'm available for whatever you want me to do. Because sometimes God don't give a job description. He just said, I want you to do my will. That's all I want you to do, my will. And that, that comes with whatever God tells you, whatever God say, whatever move God wants you to make. I remember me and my daughter, I think it was Clay Tavia, uh, when I, I went to Walmart. I didn't know why I was going to Walmart. Very simple things. And God said, go to Walmart. And when the Lord said that, I'm wondering, what do you want? Go to Walmart. I feel it in my spirit. Go to Walmart. I said, I don't know why I'm going. I don't even know why I'm going to Walmart. I said, but the, the, it's in my spirit to go. I don't know why I'm going. So he's testing me to see what I'm going to say. So I went to Walmart. Tay's with me. I said, I don't know what I'm shopping for. I'm just going around walking down, walking down the aisles, walking down the aisles, walking down the aisles. And he had me there for a reason. And one of my classmates said, hey, how you doing, Clay? I said, good. She Reverend Clay. I said, oh, well, Sister Clay is good. She said, listen, I got a question I want to ask you. I don't want to be funny, but I want to ask a question. Do y'all church take lottery money? <laughs> I told her, we was, we, was, we was doing some work on the church that time. I want to we take pottery, lottery, cottery. She said, the reason I asked you is because I hit the lottery. And she said, um, I went to take it to the church. They told me they didn't want it because it's the devil money. I said, well, where ain't the devil money over here in the Bible way? We'll, we'll, we'll fix it. <laughs> we know how to fix that devil money. Oh, we, we fix that devil money up. We put that devil money on the all prepared and we get the plan. And praying, and when we get to praying, that devil gets all out of that money. And we can cast him out of people, we can cast him out of money. Come out of Benjamin Franklin right now. Get on out of it. You get out of Jackson. Get on out. Amen. <laughs> hey, I mean, out now. Cast him out, take it right on to the bank. He's good. We'll deliver him. He's free. <laughs> but, but God had me there for a reason. And just that little old small instruction, that little old small instruction put me to where God wanted me to do. Hallelujah. Somebody lift your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Lift them up and say, thank you, Jesus. Give me the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. And verse one, Jonah one and one. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Abner, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their weakness has come up before me. But Jonah arose and fled in Tosha from the presence of the Lord. See, some of you all are trying to get away from what I told you that God wants you to do. So Sherry didn't know she'd be working in finance. She didn't think that was she didn't think she didn't think that was a job. I I told her, I saw it, I saw it on her. I saw that she had it before she got involved in it. It's a different than church finance and 
in, in home finance. I told her one day when she came into church, we was having a convention. I said, Sister Sherry, I want you to help collect registration uh, for the convention. Uh, registration was $100 then. You know, you're asking the, the, you know, you, the saints. You're just standing there getting the saints to register. The saints, you know, from the church. You know, when I had to come back, I came back to the sheriff was saying to the people that was coming, visiting and everything, you want to register with us? It's a hundred dollars. I said, oh, wait a minute. Let me, let me explain how this works. Let me explain how this works. People go come to you and I you, you know, can I register? Everybody walking in, no visitors and everybody. Said, oh, fuck. Let me let me stop. But anyway, I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. I saw that coming. I saw that in her. There's a lot of things that you can see. It's there beforehand. Don't get in an uproar when you are asked to get to a place to do something that you have no clue what you're doing. Have no idea what you're doing. Jeremiah said, I'm a child. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. Trust the judgment of the man of God who's asking you to do it. And just say, you know what? I'm going to trust that you see something that I don't see. I'm going to trust that you can look in the spirit and look beyond and you can, you can point out something in me that I don't see. You're asking me to do this task. I don't know how to do it. I don't think I have the quality to do it. And see, one of the things that you have to realize, I'm about, about to go here. One of you realize, sometimes I'm more excited about what I've asked you to do than you are because I see something that you don't see. And so my excitement about you doing it is way beyond yours. And you're saying to yourself, well, what is this? I don't know how to do this. I don't know what you want to say. I'm seeing in the spirit the future and not seeing where you are now, not seeing what you're doing now. So when I hear you playing, I hear something that you don't hear. When I see you singing, I see something that you don't see because I'm seeing a finished product. You've got to trust what I'm seeing in you even if you don't see it in yourself. That's the confidence you got to have in being asked. You know what? I'm going to do it. Why? Because a man of God sees something in me. I saw a pastor when I saw Elder Johnson. I saw it. And you know, you know where I saw it in? It was not his preaching. It was not his teaching. I saw how he interacted with people and the Lord spoke to me and said, that has a pastor. When he, when, he, when he first came in, I said, that's the pastor. I watched him around the church, how dedicated he was. This was before he started pastoring. Looked like, because everybody had raggedy cars at the church. Looked like every time after service, he got some, he under somebody, he under somebody's hood, helping and working. I said, now this brother got a pastor's heart. And I looked at his wife and her personality and the way she got it, I said, you know what? That's a first lady. She got that kind of spirit. Now God has told me some people are pastors and some of the wives that I see and I asked the Lord, I said, now did I hear you right? I said, did that? And the Lord said, that one. I said, Lord. He said, he said, I'm telling you. He said, he said, I'm working. I'm working. I'm moving. So sometime you know what I do? I'll talk to people and select people from tasks that you don't even see. And you sit there wonder, why, why, why are pastor doing that? Because I see a product. So y'all be questioning, why are pastor got them doing that? Why, why are they singing? They can't even, she sang better than that. Either. Shh. I see something. I see something. So God showed me that. And the Lord said, I want you to send him down to Arcadia. That was a that was a long drive. So send him. And you know what? The Lord was testing him there. That was a long journey. Wasn't no folk there. It was about one or two. And 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 and, and down there, it was down there that Rashonda learned to play. It was down there that Ella Johnson 
ministered and learned how to deal with people, learned how, and all of this development in him. And now when I look back and see a church that's flourishing, people are coming in. He's went from 409 uh, 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 Fifth Street now to the other church, paid that one off, growing. But see, there was in him, it was already in him. When he was drinking, it was in him. When he was in the world, it was in him. Now God said, now nah, I'm going to use him good. He's going to be able to explain the Holy Ghost and new wine real good. <laughs> he can talk about getting drunk in the spirit and all that stuff. He, he know. I see him sometimes. He be preaching and the Holy Ghost get over. I say, yeah, Lord, you got him. You got him good. I saw him one day, I saw him one day around there shot. I said, yeah, the, the Holy Ghost gave him a good, a good dose tonight. But that's what God do. God does that. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I've chosen people sometimes to minister. Uh, bishop Brookshaw was a bishop from day one. Day one. He's a bishop. I could see it in him. Many folk couldn't see it. I can see it in him. I can watch it in him. And the very one thing, he never, never, not one time have these men ever questioned where I was sending them because they trusted it. I said, Bishop Brookshaw, he didn't say, man, I got a job and a house. I said, go. He said, I'm selling it. I told him, I told him that I needed him to go to Val Doster one week. The next week he was looking for the sign. He was looking to sell. I'm selling. You want me to go, I'm gone. We didn't have nobody as a member in Val Doster. I went to I went to the library to do a lesson, and, and, and we had people that was gathering that was just there to hear. The few that was there. No, no, we might have had about, uh, I think, two members, but no solid members outside of church. So when I went there, I went in the library, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. As the Lord told me to go to the library, we, we, we was in a house, and we ended up going to the library. Went to the library, I went to a girl, never saw before in my life, said, hey, come here, you can sing, come over here with us. I said, yeah, come on, come on in here. I went and got a one from one side of the library, and brought her in there where we was. I said, she going to lead devotion. She going to sing today. She said, me? I said, yeah, you know you can sing, not sing. That's just how it happened. That's just how it happened. And that was the first one. Sister Vanessa. She, she sung. Sung a song. That became the, the, the first one that we won in outside of the Bible. Where we had some folk that was already up there. But, I mean, just that one Bible way. That cup that was the first soul that was worn in. And Bishop Brookshaw, not for a full church, not for a full congregation, went up, obeyed the Lord. Now look at what that obedience have done. Through that obedience, got his wife in. Through that obedience. Through that obedience. I went up there the other day and see him, and I saw, and, and I went to the church, and you know, he, of course. He's driving a nice now, and I'm not just in materials. I'm driving a nice BMW. Never got that in the street selling all that dope. Never got it. And then I looked over there, and sister, sister, sister Brookshaw riding in a Mercedes. I said, Ugh. over there got him a barbecue business, OM, OMG barbecue, thriving and going forward, the church growing, but all of that because he went somewhere. And he didn't see the benefit. He he just saw obedience. He didn't see there was no church there. There was no people there. He saw obedience. And that's what God said. If you'll obey what I got for you, I'll bless you. I'll bless you. My God. Somebody say hallelujah. Put your hand together and give God praises. You know, when they asked me to pass the Bible where I was a minor, I was a minor. I hadn't even turned 18. I was, I was 14 when I started coming. 15, I think, right between the 14 and 15, 
age, and Mother Myers was, uh, she was going to ask my mother, and I kind of talked vaguely about it, and uh, Mother Kyle, boy, she was blowed up. And I heard her one day around the house talking about passion. Who going to get a 15-year-old a pastor? Lord, they done lost their mind. He was in the house talking. And Mother Myers, because I, I just kind of mentioned it to see was what Mother Myers told me to say. You stood up the other night. You was at the end, end of my bed. And I said, Lord, what a man doing in my bed, and on the end of my bed. She said, was you pastor in the vision? Because she was already calling me pastor. It was you in the vision. And the Lord said, take him. He's not what he's going to be, but I'm going to make him. Mother Kyle wasn't hearing that. She said, I tell you what I'm going to do. She said, she, said, she ain't ready for it yet. I was saying to myself, you surely prophesied. She said, she ain't ready for it yet. She said, but we're going to have to work on her. We're going in prayer. Mother Cowder did all of this. I ain't hiding doing this. Because Mother Maya said she had called her sister when the Lord told her. Because she said she wanted to make sure that she was hearing God right and everything was okay. She said she called her sister on the and said, Red, the Lord told me to take uh, the little coward boy and, and tell the church that we want him to pastor. She said, what you think about that, Red? Because she said, I ain't never heard nothing like that. What you think? And she, Aunt Retta said, listen, if Mike Donald's can use them to flip burgers, God can use them to preach his word. You do what God told you to do, Mark. Say, I don't care who think you crazy, you do it. If I can use them to flip what if that woman would not have listened to God telling her a minor? I was still in school. I was still in school. I hadn't graduated. Still in school. A minor. And this woman heard the Lord say he's the one. And when I look back at this church and where we have grown, she didn't miss God. She didn't miss God. And they were telling her, they were telling her, God, all, all the ladies, they were telling her, you gone, mother, you gone, pastor, we'll listen to you. She said, no, God ain't tell me to pastor no church. God ain't never put no woman in no church. That's what I said. That ain't what God said. She obeyed the Lord. And when she obeyed the Lord, let me tell y'all, many of y'all didn't know this, but key people left. Key people left. Two or three key people left. One of them left and said, Mother Miser went crazy. And she was a member of a church, St. Peter's, in Lakeland. She went over there. She told Mother Miser she had went crazy, and she left. When she came back for one of the conventions, she called Mother Miser. She said, I need to talk to you. She said, I need to repent. I need to apologize. Because I said that you had went crazy. She said, I see what the Lord told you. And it was the Lord that told you that. But she had to obey God to go against the criticism, to go against all those things. She had to go obey God. And then God had to deal with that sister over there with that gold hat that be shining around here now. Said, hallelujah, see what the Lord done. God dealt with her. She was in church one day, fighting it in her heart. Oh, she was fighting it in church. And she was going against and opened and flipped up Bible. She popped to the scripture that said, and Joaz began to reign at seven years old. And the Lord spoke to her in church and said, now if I can use a seven-year-old to run a nation, I can use your son to pastor church. She backed up. Glory to God. Somebody say hallelujah. So you say yes to the Lord. Say yes to what God has you to do. And know that your assignment, and this is something, there's ministerial assignment and their purpose. There's a difference. Your assignment may not always be your purpose, but you have to go to your assignment so that you, it can help you fulfill your purpose. Let me tell you this. You may be assigned, and this is where we get the problem, because sometimes we're assigned to stuff that we don't like to do. Your assignment may be something that you don't like, but your assignment is preparing you for your purpose. 
Joshua was assigned to minister to Moses. And all he did was follow Moses around and did what Moses wanted him to do. But God was preparing him because while he's watching, walking with Moses and learning what Moses is doing, God is preparing him to be the next leader of Israel. So the assignment sometimes is not what we don't like. We don't like to do that. You may be the assignment as the cook because God got you prepared as the chef. And sometimes even on your job, you assign a hard and difficult task to serve people that you don't like serving and you don't want to be around and you don't want to do, but there's something that you're learning there the whole time while you're in that battle, while you're in that fight. So don't cancel your assignment even if you don't like it. If it's the call of God, if it's the work of God, do it. Do it. Somebody ought to lift your hands and say hallelujah. Quickly, Exodus 28 and 1, and take thou unto Aaron thy brother and the sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Aaron had no idea that he was selected to be a priest. Moses got up one day, got all these clothes, got them made, started putting some oil on Aaron's head and said, you're a priest now. Well, what? There are people that I've called say, hey, I want you to go down there and preach. I sent Nick down, said, Nick, go down there to Savannah, preach. Ella Andrew Johnson, I appreciate that young man. He's been somewhere everywhere, wherever he's assigned. But he's picking up something everywhere he go. Go here, go here, go here. Some of the assignments, he, they didn't go well. But it was learning experience. Next assignment, next assignment, next assignment. I say this all the time. God is blessing those young men and developing them there. He's blessing them, developing them. First Samuel 9 and 16. Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee, thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and I shall anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistine, for I have looked upon my people because their cry is coming to me. So when men of God anointed people in the Bible, when they anointed people in the Bible, they just went, put oil on them, consecrated them, and say, all right, you're anointed to be king. God told me to anoint you to be king. To that to trust the judgment. Put oil on them, do it. Seven years old, anointed to be king. Eight years old, anointed to be king. But because the man of God has the confidence in those seven years old, he said, all right, this is one that's over the nation of Israel, and he looked for God to give wisdom to them. Moses went to his brother, anointed him, said, you're the next priest. First King chapter 9, Samuel went to uh, 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 Saul and said, you're the next king. Not only that, while David was in the field, just in the field, Saul, Samuel went out there and anointed him to be king. Without him having any knowledge of what he was supposed to do, he trusted the man of God when he said do it. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, when Samuel was there and heard the voice of God, the man of God told him, what, gave him instruction of what he should do. He got up and obeyed God. This year, I want everybody to be sensitive in the spirit. Got two scriptures to give you. Be sensitive to the in the spirit of what specific assignment God give you, whether it's for the choir, whether it's for the usher board, whether it's for yam, whether it's for pastors, whether it's for whatever it is. Be, be aware of the specific instruction that God give you because those specific instructions are going to bring you great blessings this year. And not just the stuff that you want to do, but the stuff that you don't want to do. After God got through with Abraham, God said, Abraham, in blessing you, I'm going to bless you now because you made that sacrifice to say yes. So whatever it is, whether it's mopping the church, whether it's sweeping the floor, whether it's serving, and I've given a lot of you all some very different, different giving you some very different instructions this year that have nothing to do with just what you normally do. I have you out there this year uh, at the New Year's fixing up the New Year's. I got Sister Coward working on something. Sister Camilla working on something. Sandra, I have you working on something, uh, and Janae, and I got other ones working on things that seem to be maybe out of your element. It's not out of your element. What's happening, God, is 
giving me now the okay to start putting y'all in some of the places that God wants to work for the ministry. And some of them are assignments. Some of them are temporarily. They're not forever. They're assignments. Just a temporary. Don't complain about them. Don't fuss about them. When you get the assignment, just say, Lord, here am I. Yes, Lord. And watch, watch how things are going to change in your own personal life because God is seeing you saying yes to him in your spiritual life. Just say yes to God. Just say yes. Whatever it is that you need me to do, whatever you're calling me for, whatever assignment, whatever task that I'm giving, I'm saying yes to the Lord. Lift your hands up and say yes. Lift them up again and say yes. Lift them up again and say yes. Lift them up again and say yes. Say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. To your will, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bahasa. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. With all of my insecurities, yes. With everything that I don't know how to do, yes. With everything I don't have an idea of how to do it, yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. Lift your hands up just a few minutes. I'm going to finish these scriptures, but lift them up. Lift them up. Lift them up. Listen. 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 This is Oshakato Shalebi Kodebiata. Listen. Rabakashi Kodebiata. I want you to get this. Rabakashi Kodebiata. Some of you are you're having the debate of saying yes to the Lord because you're looking at your ability now, not knowing if you say yes, then he'll equip with you with what you need. Isaiah said no to the Lord because he said I'm a man of unclean lips, but the Lord wanted him to understand if you say yes, I'll clean your lips. If you say yes, I'll bless you. Some of you all, this is the year you need to get that book out. You need to get it written. When I met Pastor Porter's mother, I said to her, I said, you got a book that you need to write. Get it written. Of course, the Lord blessed her to fulfill it, and she got it out. But there's some of you that God wants to use you in your writing skills and your writing ability that you need to minister to people. And some of you, even before, I, there are people sometimes before I get to you, God is telling you what to do, and God will send me to establish what you feel in your spirit. So sometimes he starts telling you, he starts speaking to you, you feel drawn to it, and every now and then God will say to me to say, tell this sister this, tell this sister yet, tell this sister this. That's God just pretty much many times equipping you and letting you know that's an assurity of the Lord. And many of you, what you've been through last year and what you've been through the year before, the things that you've been through, God was prepping you for ministry. Sometimes you have an assignment but don't have experience. So God lets you go through something so that when he calls you for the assignment that you have the experience. So, so some of y'all don't know the stuff that you went through in your life and the stuff that you went through in, in the time that you're not going through it now but God put you through that so that right now you will be able to minister. Somebody say Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. I wonder why that I had been through so many things I've been through in my childhood. I wonder why I didn't have my father in my childhood. But then when I see that I'm pastoring a, a lot of men who are fatherless, then I understand. I said, oh, now I can relate to them. I can minister to them. I can preach to them in a way that I wouldn't normally be able to preach. I could talk to them in a way that I wouldn't normally talk. You women that have been hurting women, you're going to be able to be the one that minister to hurting women because I haven't been through that. I got the message, but I don't have the experience. So everything that you've been through, God is going to use that as a part of what he want to do with you. Listen at this last scripture in the book of Acts chapter 9 and 1. And saw yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Went unto the high priest and desired of a ladder to the masters of the synagogue. That if he found any of that way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, 
uh, and the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the prick. And trembling and astonished said, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And he, the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told what thou must do. And verse 10, and there was a certain disciple named, at, at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judah for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayed, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. And verse 14, and here he has authority that the, that the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of the earth. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. What I'm showing you, Paul asked, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord didn't tell him. But in the 15th verse, he said, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. He told Ananias what he wouldn't tell Peter, what he wouldn't tell Paul. Paul asked, what would you have me to do? And God wouldn't tell him. And Ananias and ain't asked nothing, and God told him. Many of you right now who have asked God what, you, what he wants you to do, and he's not answering, I got the answer to it. I got the answer to it. So when I come up to you and tell you what it is that you need to do, don't fight it. It's the Lord talking to you, giving you some directions. How many of y'all willing to do whatever the Lord would have you to do? Stand to your feet with both of your hands up in the air. Then I'm going to put some oil on you and pray with you. If you know that, If you know that your heart, that you operate effectively in administration, but you have a heart and a passion for helping people, social work, homeless, hungry, helping others, how do you know what God, uh, what, what it is God want you to do? Would it be uh, having your already in or uh, what uh, you have a passion a desire to do. Let me say this. Sometimes the place that God has you is a temporary assignment. And sometimes there's not an assignment that's permanent. They're temporary. That's the first thing I want you to get. Secondarily, some things are the ministry of the saints to the world. There's a ministry that all of us are supposed to have. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked. That's the ministry of the church at large. You notice I didn't talk much about those today because that's, a, that's, that's evangelism. That's all of our ministry. So that's common. That's natural. That's what comes with your heart. I'm, tonight I was dealing specifically with the ministry and the saints, the ministry to the leaders and the ministry uh, to the Lord. I want everybody in this building tonight to come and lift your hands up. Lift your hands up. Is Amelia here? Come here, Amelia. Take this song, yes. Yes. Everybody lift your hands. I've given the oil away again. Do I have any more? <laughs> All right, Margaret's got it. Everybody come. Everybody come. Everybody come. Everybody come a little closer. God has a great ministry for you, Rose. You're going to bless a lot of young ladies, a lot of young people. God is maturing you. He's going to give you wisdom of somebody that's in their 50s and 60s to be able to minister to others. Something wonderful is going to come out of your life. You just stay before God. Young women are going to gravitate to you. You're going to be able to minister to them. You're going to be able to talk to them. Many things gonna happen. God is, God is giving you instant maturity. It's happened. It's gonna start happening in your life instantly. Thank you, Jesus. God is touching you, Darlene. He's changing your perception, changing your view of how you see ministry. 
how you see people, how you see the work of God, putting your heart in, putting your all in. Lift your hands up. Lift your hands up. Let the Lord know, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do it. Lift them up, lift them up, lift them up. Jesus, God, I praise you. I praise you. I praise you, Lord. I say yes to you. Yes to your way, yes to your will, yes to your work. Lift those hands up. Whatever my lot is, whatever you want me to do, Sharamokosata. I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it. I'll do it. Use my hands. Use my hands. Use my mouth. Whatever part of me you want to use, whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, I'm available. And Lord, the challenges that have come in the way of me working in the kingdom, the challenges that are standing in the way of me doing what you have me to do, I will work even against them. I will work even against them, the blockages, the hindrances, the roadblocks that Satan have put in the way to try to stop me, the afflictions that the devil, I come against them in the name of Jesus and I thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. My own insecurities, I thank you. Job problems, family problems, whatever is standing in the way, health problems, I command you in Jesus' name to move out of my way and if you don't move out of my way I'm going to run through anyway I rebuke the spirit of discouragement the spirit of heaviness let me tell you something and I want you to be aware of this you can try to do things and work on things and they'll fail over and over and over again and the devil will keep telling you when they fail this ain't for you you, you, you're not to do this. This ain't going to happen. When you feed, see those failures, you have to work against your own failures, your own discouragement. You got to work against them. When you all see, and I want you to understand, because a lot of you think that when you see me working in things that I've just, it just, it's just happened. I've had many things that I've worked on that were failed attempts, but I kept working. I kept working. I saw this church greater and bigger. So me and Brother Washington, I said, I want a, I want a balcony in the church. Me and Brother Washington, somebody else, we got together and called ourselves putting the balcony up. I don't know who else was with us. I've been one or two more. But I was going to put a balcony up. Because I wanted, I saw us being bigger. I saw us growing. Put the balcony up. The only person who could stand up in it was me. But I want it bigger. I want it better. So I went up in the back and everybody else had to lean down. I just, we had to turn it into a, a booth for the sound. There are many attempts of things that I've had to do and I've had to work and I've, 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 I've failed until the Lord said, you haven't failed until you stop trying. You haven't failed until you stop trying. Don't think because God has called you to ministry because some of you all are meeting challenge. Don't think because God has called you to ministry it's going to be easy. It's going to just it, it happen because Moses was called to tell Pharaoh to let God's people go but he went there and he got he, he, he was told no, I ain't going. They're not going anywhere. But when you make your call and election sure you keep going back to places that didn't yield results. I reminded of the story of Bishop G.T. Haywood. I heard this story. It may be a myth, but I heard it as a story, and I heard the minister said it, that he went as the Lord had instructed him. That he was trying to build a church, and the Lord told him, say, go down there and tell the people at the bank to give you $25,000 to, to build this building. That I said to give you $25,000. So he went down to the bank, and he goes to the bank and tells the banks, I'd like to get a loan for $25,000 to, so we can build our building. And the bank turned him down. Told him no. And when he went back, he went back discouraged, went back to the congregation discouraged. But the Lord said, that's not what I told you to tell them. I told you to go back to the bank and tell them that the Lord said to give you that money. So he went back to the bank and said, the Lord told me to tell you to give me $25,000 to complete the church. The man said, uh, Pastor Hayward, why didn't you tell us that from the beginning? 
We trust when the Lord tells you something, say, go ahead and get the money they wrote out and gave it to him. I just want you to know that because you're meeting challenge doesn't mean that's not what God wants. Because you're getting opposition, that doesn't mean that that's not what God wants. And, and this year, I want you to be anointed to fight through your discouragement. Because many of you last year, when you got in the middle of it, you stopped. You got to a point, you just gave up. You got to a point, you said, but lift your hands right now and let the Lord know God, anoint me to go through it. I want to fulfill your plan in my life. I want you to feel, fulfill your plan. Every time I get ready to do this, something come up. Every time I get ready to fulfill this, something challenges it. Every time I get ready to go forward, something stands in my way. I feel this spirit of discouragement, this spirit of heaviness. Every time I'm going up, I get pushed down. But in the name of Jesus Christ right now, I declare in the name of Jesus, I'm going to press through it. I'm going to fulfill what God has for me to do tonight. It's in the name of Jesus. I come against the spirit of discouragement, the spirit of heaviness, the spirit of weight. You will be that youth leader that God wants you to be. You will be that praying woman, that woman that God wants you to be. You will be that evangelist that God wants you to be. You will work and do the work that God wants you to do. In the name of Jesus, I decree it, I declare it, I speak it in the name of Jesus. I command it to be so in the name of Jesus. I glorify you. I magnify you. In Jesus' name. 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 Yes, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I bless your name. I bless your name. I bless your name. I bless your name. I give you glory. I praise your name. I say yes to you, Lord. I say yes to you, Lord. I say yes to you. I give you the glory. I give you the praise. I honor your name. I give you glory. 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 Oh, Shataba. Shumabu Kosatiata. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.